Hello everyone and welcome back. This is episode two on the paint series with SADA for Project FXR71 and we've got a lot of stuff to cover. But one of the things we're going to talk about is this SADA primer gun that I ordered. I finally got all my guns in. Uh, then we're also going to talk about this tank. If you, if you may have seen in the previous video how rusted out it was. So we're going to cover how I removed the rust from the inside and then sealed the tank. And then we're going to pack in a lot of tips and tricks that I've learned from some of the pros I've been talking to on how to make this paint project go as smoothly as possible. So stick around. I want to start by saying by, by no means am I an expert on painting, but what I am is fortunate enough. I'm blessed to know people that are experts in this field and they're willing to help with their time and their experience to help me grow and learn this as well. So I'm gonna ask for your patience. If we've got some pros that are watching this uh, in the painting side of things that um, I may I get some terminology wrong or something like that, just uh, bear with me and feel free to offer constructive criticism and, and lend your expertise as well in the comments below as we move along. So, you know, I wanna start out by giving a big thanks to like Andy Anderson, Tony Larimer there at, uh, at Dan Am Company in Sada, and also, you know, Ron Fleenor at Flea's Custom Paint. Uh, these guys have been awesome uh, to be able to ask questions and stuff. So uh, anyway, so we're going to get started. So the, the first thing that I did uh, with this tank, as you, as you could see, was uh, it completely rusted out on the inside and out. And so where I like to start with that is uh, to actually do a vinegar bath. Now, one thing you can do is order a bunch of these little silicone plugs. As you can see, I've got them in the bottom of the tank for various different reasons that I'll get to in a minute. Uh, so you can order these rubber plugs uh, cheap from virtually anywhere. So where I'd like to start is to actually do a vinegar bath. So inside the tank, I'll seal up all the holes and I'll fill the tank up with vinegar and a handful of, of say, sheetrock screws, right? And I would strongly encourage you to count the screws uh, when you put them in. Now, you want to let that vinegar soak for, uh, you know, upwards of 45 minutes to an hour in some cases and every few minutes pick up the tank and agitate it really good flip it around and that'll get the loosen up a lot of the scale and loose pieces of rust and things like that and kind of start to etch it then after you do that drain the tank entirely uh, I re remove all the screws and then also give it a good rinse now the second step is actually and you got to be careful with this stuff guys uh, muriatic acid muriatic acid is actually a bit of a diluted hydrochloric acid and it's some pretty nasty stuff so you want to make sure that you've protected yourself the clothing the gloves you know a, a respirator uh, and and you're doing it in a well ventilated area because it's some very nasty stuff to work with you want to have plenty of of water around and that sort of thing uh, and maybe even some baking soda in case you spill it or something like that so just be careful with it but uh, after you rinse out the from that vinegar stage then put about a gallon of muriatic acid in the tank and it only takes about 30 to 45 seconds okay uh, pour that in agitate it inside the tank really well uh, and you know maybe you know pull your uh, rag or something that you have on the top pull the rag look down in there see if it's all gone agitate it again but again it should only take about 30 to 45 seconds and then pour out all of that muriatic acid into a safe place dispose of it properly all that type of good stuff remember it's nasty nasty stuff uh, and the second that you get that poured out I'd, I just put a uh, pull the plugs out of the bottom and put a water hose in it turn the water on wide open and just let it sit and flush and then once, uh, once you've got that done, then I like to drain the tank again. And then I'll pour in MEK, methyl ethyl ketone. You can get that from any paint supply store, really. Uh, acetone would work as well, just not, it doesn't etch quite as well as MEK does. MEK is also some very nasty stuff, so uh, very nasty solvent. So then I'll put about a gallon of MEK in and shake that around for a couple of minutes, give or take. Drain all of that out, dispose of it, of course. Accordingly, I'll remove all the plugs from the tank entirely and just put an airline in to say maybe your, your fuel bib, your fuel valve uh, bung in there and just leave the tank open and let the air circulate through it for 
10 minutes or so, give or take, to get it completely dry. Now, I prefer to use Caswell tank sealer, and there's various different options for you out there. Uh, I prefer Caswell because I've always had fantastic luck with it, using it in conjunction with the process that I mentioned. Now, I, I do apply the Caswell a little bit different than how they recommend. The uh, when, when I pour it in, I'll pour in the full contents, and Caswell actually recommends just, you know, rotating the tank around for, you know, a couple of minutes or something like that, and then pouring out the, act, the excess. Uh, I don't do it that way. Uh, Any time that I've seen Caswell fail or any of the other tank sealers, uh, what you see are little tiny, very thin flakes. And so I know with the Caswell, once this stuff cures, I'm actually forming a bladder on the inside of the tank. So if something happened, say, and it delaminated for the, from the tank for, for whatever reason, I've never had that happen, but if it uh, delaminated from the tank, I would at least have a thick layer left where it could hold its own, sh own shape and not break off into little tiny flakes and then get, you know, fuel filter, get in your car, that sort of thing. So uh, what I'll do, I'll pour the entire contents in, I'll find a comfortable place to sit and then rotate the tank very slowly looking inside and uh, this until it stops flowing on the inside of the tank. So, you know, sometimes this can take this can take 30 to 45 minutes in some cases. Remove all the plugs from it. Uh, use either a pipe cleaner or you can even blow air through it uh, into like your vent uh, your, for your vent lines and, and anything like that that, uh, that that blow that out. Make sure those aren't obstructed right during that process as well. And then once you do that, leave everything open and let the tank sit for a couple of days. Now we move to the tank and how to remove the rust there. I, this one was rusted up bad enough that I decided to bead blast it. So you could use sandpaper, of course, uh, but that, that could take a while on this tank as bad as it was. So I put it in the bead blaster to remove the bulk of the rust. And you also, when you're, when you're doing that, before you put in that bead blaster, of course, you now have a clean tank on the inside. So use your rubber plugs again. Plug all the holes, all the screw holes uh, on the outside. Uh, tape the inside of the, t you know, up here really, really well. And that way you won't get any sand on the inside if you go that route. I went through the bead blast and then I also pulled out my sandpaper. Now the manufacturer whose epoxy primer I'm using, they recommend a 180 to 220 uh, sanded finish and then of course it's appropriate for direct to metal application. So after talking to Tony, it, uh, I really enjoyed speaking with him. I mean, the guy's got almost 30 years in, uh, of experience with Dan Am Company uh, as the, the exclusive distributor for SADA. Uh, so he, based on uh, you know, my input, he recommended several guns for me uh, that, that kind of fit how I, how I think that I would paint. You know, I've done a lot of practicing along the way. So one of my limitations, as I'd mentioned before, or I guess you would say challenges, is being blind in my right eye. So I, I have a problem with depth perception, you know, and, and some of the practicing that I've done, I, I found that, you know, I, I tend to move fast with a gun, and I also spray a little bit further back. And uh, just to give me a little margin for error, it, it helps me with my depth perception only looking, you know, looking through one eye. So when we went through all the guns, we first, we, we wanted a dedicated specific primer gun. So the one that we're starting with for the epoxy primer is actually suitable for any of your primer sealers. So this is the Sada Jet 100 BF in the RP version. Remember they have two versions. They have the, the RP and the HVLP both in primer guns. Now the, the reason he chose the RP for me is because it allows me to spray a little further back. With an HVLP gun, you, you want to spray in just a little bit tighter uh, and also you move a little bit slower with an HVLP gun as well. So he felt the RP would be right for me. And uh, we did it with a 1.4 nozzle set. Uh, and so again, this would be suitable for uh, the epoxy primer, which is the first step, and then also our primer sealers as we go uh, as well. So this was a perfect gun for that. Uh, I also got a second gun, a primer gun, but in an HB, HVLP, and uh, that one has a 1.9 nozzle set on it. So that nozzle set is more appropriate for your thick, high build 
primer. So that gun will be specific for my high build primers. And when we get to the, that high build stage, I'll show you that gun in the next episode. So that's why we went with this one. And you'll also notice on the back here, I decided to go with the Atom 2 digital pressure gauges here. And so there's, there's only one gauge. It actually comes off really easily like that right there, and yet they have these docks. So I basically put one of these Atom docks in all of the guns, and then I just get to use this, uh, the, the gauge itself, and just slide it into place. So that's pretty trick. And uh, so there's a, a, some tips and tricks that I wanna go through with you guys that uh, Tony shared with me. Uh, so one of the biggest things is, is your, your compressor. We've gotta think about the compressor and its ability to handle the volume. Now here, here at my shop, I have an 80 gallon uh, compressor back there, two stage. Uh, at home, I have a 15 gallon compressor. And I was just playing around with the gun and, and comparing the shop air versus air at the house. And could I spray with a smaller compressor? Yes, but I have to be very careful and mindful of the pressures. All right, not only the inlet pressure at the gun, but also uh, the, the spray pressure here. Uh, and it's gonna depend on a lot of things, the, the size of your hoses, the length of your hoses and all that. Because when, what I've, I've come to understand from Tony is it's, it's how efficiently the gun itself will handle the air. And there is a bit of a difference between the RP and HVLP on that aspect as well. So I, I just need to be aware that if I'm spraying with an HVLP gun, that my cap pressure is going to be 10 to 12 PSI, give or take. Uh, with the RP guns, it's at roughly at about 20 PSI. So I just kind of need to be mindful of that uh, during my application process. But the gun setup is virtually the same either way. So it, it has a lot to do that the gun is designed for maximum air efficiency. How efficient it is handling the air coming into it will be reflected in, the, in how the paint lays down, the atomization. And they have this term uh, they, they call... Uh, uh, transfer efficiency. So that's basically how much paint went through the gun versus how much paint actually sticks to what you're spraying. And so, you know, they're designed for maximum transfer efficiency in a situation where the guns are wide open and getting a, a, a higher volume of air, not necessarily as much pressure. So that's uh, an important aspect. So one of the first things that I do want to talk about, we, we want to minimize the challenges, you know, for you guys that are new painters. So one of the things we want to talk about are the your airline fittings right you can see this one here now this is just a cheap one that i picked up at an auto parts store but let's compare the sizes of this fitting versus that one you can see it's quite a bit different there right now this uh, there's several companies that make them like this this particular nozzle my entire shop it's all i've ever used for years and years and years uh is the milton v style and it's the it's part of their pro flow series i use this i've, I've used it for uh, over a decade on every piece of air equipment that i actually have i found that everything runs a lot more efficiently uh, when i have this type of fitting so this was great for me i already use them now one challenge you might have at home you may not have an air water separator all right so i i do have one here at the shop and uh you know use it i've always used it so and then i also i don't know if you can see how my airlines are done i mounted all my airlines up very high and then about every 10 feet i have a drop and that drop goes down with a drain on the bottom. So not only do I have a dryer on my compressor, but I also have drops all along the way here uh, to collect any possible moisture. So I know that I'm getting good, dry, clean air. So some of you guys at home may have to use one of these. All right, now this, you know, onto the bottom of the gun here. And uh, this isn't, this is, exactly what we're talking about it's a it's a, a water air separator and you can see there's a little bit of water in this already from where i was trying this at home and it does a great job of filtering that last bit of air out but it also creates creates a restriction in your airflow so i would say if you do decide to use one of these or find that you have to use one pay particular attention to that air pressure because this will create a restriction for you all right, so the first thing that I've done this morning is I went back to my compressor and I adjusted my regulator pressure down to about 35 PSI at the compressor, all right? Because, again, the gun is designed for maximum airflow wide open on all the settings. So I kinda, I, I don't want to rely on the gun to try to reduce my 
pressure. You know, most shot pressure can be 100 to 120 PSI, which is where I run mine most of the time. So I've dialed it back to about, actually I take that back, I've dialed it back to about 40 PSI on the compressor because by the time it goes through all my lines and actually through this hose and all the fittings and finally gets to me, that transfers to about 30 PSI at the gun, okay? So uh, it's adjusting at the compressor to get to about 30 PSI on the gun, and then I use the adjuster here to dial it down to 26 to 28 PSI, which is where Tony recommended that I spray. So let's go through the process of setting that up, adjusting the gun, and then we're actually gonna run some water through this uh, because I wanna review with you what each one of these knobs do on the side and how it affects how you're gonna spray. All right, you can see we got our atom dock installed here, and then when you supply air to the gun, uh, it automatically turns it on. All right, and right now we're actually at about 44 PSI at the gun. My compressor is, uh, is completely charged and all the lines are open. And so if we pull the trigger completely, we're gonna see that we drop 27, 26, 27. And we're between 26 and 28 PSI when we're actually spraying. Now, if I were to take, and this is how you adjust it right here. So if I pull on this, I can dial that fully open. And you can see I'm fully open, I'm at 29 PSI. So now I'm gonna dial this back down until I get an average of about 28. All right, so that's the first place we're gonna start. Now, let's put some water in it and a piece of cardboard and let's look at some of the adjustments. One of the other things that I ordered from SADA is their disposable cup system. As you can see here, it has all your mix ratios all the way around the cup here. So it makes it real easy to, to do all of your, your mixing, quite frankly. Uh, it comes with a cap here, also comes with a cap uh, for the top there if you have to store it for a few minutes. And then there's filters that go on the inside as well. So this makes this a, a lot easier to spray. Of course, we've just got water in it now to demonstrate how the adjustments for the gun. All right, and the system's pretty easy how it works, right? It's just uh, basically a quarter turn into the top of the gun right there. And then before you start spraying, you wanna make sure that you lift, snap that up right there, allows the airflow to flow through. So one of the first things we wanna do is make sure that our air cap is horizontal because we want a vertical spray pattern. And we're gonna set that right there. Okay, so we've got the pressure set. We can verify that again on the Atom 2, and we can do a little test spray. That's actually quite an incredible atomization there, all right? So again, the guns are designed to operate wide open. And so we've got our pressure valve dialed back just a little bit here. We've got our fluid nozzle, which I'll get to that in just a second. I've got it all the way out. And uh, basically what this, this knob does here is adjust the travel of the needle itself. So be before I hooked up my air, I actually had pulled the trigger all the way and adjusted this all the way out so my trigger was fully open, you know, fully back, right? And then dialed the, dialed the fluid adjuster to where it just started putting pressure onto uh, on, onto the lever here, right? So uh, I know that I'm operating wide open on, on the fluid here. Now this is, uh, Tony actually calls this the flat round knob. So if I turn this all the way counterclockwise, I'm going to get a very, you know, a flat fan pattern like you see here. All right. Now if I take this and I dial it all the way back in, it's going to produce a round spray pattern. Like that, quite a bit different. So let's do a test spray wide open and see what it looks like. I'll give you another little tip of, and this came from Tony and Andy and Ron and a few guys. You know, when, when you see people doing test sprays, sometimes they'll just go like that. And that's not a real accurate representation of, of, of the actual fluid transfer. So what Tony recommends is when you, the second you start spraying, to count one one thousand and that's how long you want to do it to see uh, you'll also see I've, I've seen a few videos where guys will actually turn the air cap vertically 
and spray and look at the runs on the vertical to see if they have an even spray pattern and look at the runs as it comes down. And again, you know, Tony feels that that's really not an accurate representation either. So it's, we want to test spray exactly like we're going to be spraying. So we've got our round flat knob all the way counterclockwise, which is our fan, wide open. We're at 28 PSI with the fluid control nozzle, uh, the fluid control all the way open, all right? All right, I know I'm using it with water, it's kind of hard to see, but what I've got is a very broad, uh, a, a nice pattern here that covers a large area with virtually no overspray in this area right here, uh, which is pretty incredible. Yeah, here it's dry on both sides, and that's what I'm after. Now, one adjustment you can make if you've got a little bit too much overspray in this area then you can actually dial that knob down just a little bit to tighten it up. But if I were to do a, you know, a big turn clockwise, making it more round, you see how I'm going to get a circle. And we don't want that. And you can see how all of that. So we want to try to leave this all the way open. Now, if I wanted to spray a smaller area, say I didn't want to do, you know, I just want to do kind of a spot repair, but keep my fan pattern. That's when we would dial in our fluid control. We want to keep the fan wide open, but dial in our fluid control. And you can see I can get into a much smaller area there, and that fan's about that big. All right, and that, that size area there. So that's where you would use that fluid control. And then if we had a, you know, a very, very small spot repair, for example, we could either use a mini jet or we could begin to dial this down in the area uh, to, to get it more of a round pattern. And then that's when you would bring in your, bring in your fluid control and you could do a, and get closer. And see, we still have no overspray around in this area here. But that allows me to do, you know, much, much smaller areas. But since we're doing total coverage, we're going to leave it, we're going to leave it wide open. All right. One of the next things we want to talk about is spray distance. As I'd mentioned, you know, with an RP, it's got a little higher cap pressure. But with an RP, I can actually be a little further off of the surface, uh, somewhere in the six to eight inch range uh, when I'm doing my spray. So one way you can check this is if you hold your hand in front of the gun like this and move it slowly toward your hand, you'll actually feel a wall of air. You'll feel the point where it seems like all the air is converging. And at that one point where that starts is the point that you're going to get maximum transfer efficiency. There's that word again, or phrase again. And so that's the distance that you want to be from the surface when you spray. So if we... and I can feel it around, about right there. So about that distance, and we're at around six to eight inches, give or take, right? And you can actually, if you listen closely, you can actually hear it, all right? Hear the point where the tone changed? So from that point right there, I'm about like that. So let's put some water in it and run a pattern. Now, if I look at this, I don't see really any runs of any kind at all. And there's not a lot of overspray in this area right here. So if I was actually spraying color, I would do about a 75% overlap on this. And of course, I would run the actual material that I'm going to be spraying with a uh, you know, piece of poster board or you know, paper or something like that, uh, that I can get a really good feel for it. But if I come up, and I go to my six, eight inches like this, then I'm ready to spray. With about a, as you could see, about a 75% overlap. So we'll practice that again. There's my six to eight inches. And there we go. A great tip that I got from Andy when taping off areas uh, for your fuel cap specifically. Uh, first off, you don't want to get 
any of your paint, any of your clears underneath the sealing surface of your cap, be it an O-ring or a rubber seal of anything like that, you want direct to metal contact. The reason are all the fuel vapors and things can you know sit underneath there and then start to bubble and delaminate and then eventually just destroy the paint in that area and then it'll flake out from there. So one of the things that Andy recommended was when I mask off for that area to actually mask just slightly beyond where the fuel cap is going to seal and to, to maintain that over the course of all of my primer base and, and clear stages. And then once I'm done, retape that area, but bring the tape right to the point of the sealing surface of the cap. Then apply your final clear. And that way that last stage of clear will actually seal the edges of all the layers uh, underneath it, and you won't have that buildup of paint underneath the sealing surface. And so I've plugged all the holes, as you can see. All right, one of the things I'm also going to mask off is around the threads for the bung, uh, for the, the fuel valve. And I've also plugged the holes for the, the crossover there and the two mounting tabs there on the bottom. So we wanna keep those threads nice and clean. So cleanliness is everything with this. We, we, we want to avoid oils from our fingers and any contamination, even during the sanding process, because you know that oils and things can really permeate inside that metal. So you always wanna handle it with, with gloves. And at each step and several steps along the way, while we're sanding, remember how much rust I had on this tank, while we're sanding, you can just use an aerosol glass cleaner. And I like to use a lint-free microfiber instead of a, uh, you know, using paper towels and things like that. At this point, other than getting into the little nooks and crannies that the DA couldn't get to, you know, you use your hands, of course, with that 180 paper. You can also get a very coarse red or coarser Scotch-Brite to get into those areas uh, that your DA can't get into. But other than that, at this point, I would clean it again with, with the uh, glass cleaner. Also grab a new microfiber, it's completely clean and I would wipe it down with a wax and grease remover and then also a tack cloth and start to spray my epoxy primer. Unfortunately, it has been raining for two days straight and uh, it's a little too humid for me to be spraying. The temperature's perfect, but remember, I don't have a paint booth yet, so I have to be mindful of the weather. It's just entirely too humid uh, to spray that. So uh, in the next episode, we'll be reviewing the gun again from SADA. We're gonna go through and spray that epoxy primer and let it cure, and then we'll start talking about guide coating high build primers, the gun for the high build primer and all that type of stuff. And before we take off and do that, again, I need to give a big thanks to uh, Andy Anderson at Anderson Studio, Ron Flenor, and especially Tony Larimer at Dan Am Company and SADA for helping me out through this process. These guys are sharing information with me and teaching me, and then you get to see me do it and I get to teach you. So I'm very excited to be doing this and a big thanks to those guys for, uh, for helping me out. So until next time, guys, uh, we'll be ready to spray. Hope you've enjoyed the video. If you haven't subscribed and you think I've earned it, please hit the subscribe button and hit a thumbs up and also the reminder bell so you'll get a notification next time I post a video. See all those engines? We've got a bunch of engine teardown videos coming as well. Take care of yourselves and each other, guys. Have a good one.